I'm John Drew, Billy's little brother. It's an honor to be with you here today. This is the role that Bill would usually fill, and it's going to be tough for these size nines to fill those shoes. Bill was always the member of the family that represented us at every wedding, funeral, bat mitzvah, and the like. I would like to take this opportunity to share some of the family and personal stories about the legend that was my brother Bill. Bill was my hero. And as the collage out front says, he was larger than life. The reputation that followed Bill was one of a superhuman. He could run faster, jump higher, lift more, hit harder, drink, and eat more than anyone alive, <laughs> and carry a swagger like few could. He was the first born in a family of six, five boys and our sister Mary. The definition of what was to become the baby boomer generation. Bill had over two dozen first cousins, at least ten of which are with us today. Our dad was an accountant by trade. He worked for the general accounting office for 20 years, and plus a career on Capitol Hill. For those of you that knew our mom, it's hard to describe her with just one sentence. Her Washington Post obituary headlined, Peace Activist. She was a deeply religious person, a radical, and never wanted to conform to the status quo in the church or the government. From that DNA, it's not hard to see how Bill became both the engineer and the advocate for change that he was. As you know, Bill was born on the 4th of July in Madison, Wisconsin, home of my parents on the water, the University of Wisconsin. My mom was always interested in the latest science, so she signed Bill up for a college study to test the effects of feeding red meat to infants. <laughs> Not the pureed stuff that kids eat out of jars today. I'm talking steak. <laughs> Who knows if this was the reason he grew into the legendary frame that he was. From then on, Billy had a ferocious appetite. Growing up, our parents placed locks on our kitchen pantry cabinets because he could literally eat you out of the house. And Billy would eat anything. When my uncle Bill returned from the career war, he gave Billy a standard army K ration. Bill sat down and ate the whole thing, and then proceeded to smoke some enclosed cigarette. <laughs> when Bill was eight, our father accepted an assignment in London, England, and our family lived there for five years in the late 50s. These adolescent years spent in a foreign land helped define Bill later in life. He learned to play football, or what we call soccer, and upon his return to the U.S., he took a lead to introduce soccer in his high school. He was a typical, precocious young man, and he and his brothers loved to have adventurous fun. Bill's informative years were in the late 50s and early 60s. Not exactly happy days or leave at the beaver, but pretty close. Billy long had a fascination with the space program, and especially rockets. While the U.S. and USSR were locked in a space race of their own, Bill had his own space program going on. Before the age of 10, he discovered how trapping liquid fuel and igniting it could send a trash can blade soaring 15 feet in the air. This would progress to model rockets like we have today, except back then they were powered by a little tablet, like an alpha seltzer. The standard rocket would take six tablets. Billy discovered that if you crammed 20 tablets, you could send a rocket hundreds of feet into the air. His man, or let's say mouse program, started shortly after the USSR sent a dog into space. Not to be outdone, he raised white mice, fitted his rockets with a clear plastic tube, and then launched the mice into space. Always the animal lover, no mice were ever hurt, and there was always a safe recovery. When spy satellites were launched, Bill discovered a way to outfit a rocket with a camera, and had a timer to snap a photo while it was Later in life, this love is what took him to the Navy's Flight Admission Technician School, then Engineering School at the University of Maryland, and later to his rewarding career in the missile defense industry. He could also put on a legendary fireworks show. At our triennial Julian family reunion, he helped the Class C explosive license to purchase these bombs, but no permit to set them off. <laughs> Who needs a stinking permit? This show was set off for just us at Sister Mary's Retreat House in Western PA. It would put your local town or shopping center mall to shame. While living in England, to say my mom had her hands full was an understatement. Billy and his brothers were constantly into something. 
Some of it just innocent fun, like plugging in the US record player into the British 220 electrical system and then playing records at twice their normal speed. <laughs> they would sit there and laugh at the funny music until the electrical fire started, and Billy stepped up to put it out with a squirt gun. Then there was the, brick, the brush fire started in the backyard. This took the neighborhood bucket brigade, which had not been active since the war, to douse it out. It was all too much for my mom. So she decided to send Billy and Michael to a form school, I mean boarding school, <laughs> St. Joseph College in Jewel Hill in London. Billy continued to test the authority of the brothers there, and instead of being able to come home on weekends, he was frequently gated, or gaited, as he would say in his newly formed British accent. This was their form of detention. And it was just the beginning of a steady succession of school disciplinarians like Sister Cecilia and Mr. McNally, who became very familiar with our home phone. My mom could go on for hours with story after story that started with, Mrs. Druin, your son Bill. <laughs> Bill moved here to Percival in 1980, and at the time he worked in Annapolis, Maryland. Many would call that a day's drive, but to Billy it was the daily commute. He owned a hopped up RX-7 at the time, and, and in the same way that ambulance has the word spelled out in reverse in the front to warn it, he was reproaching you from the rear, Bill had die-cut vinyl letters across the top of his windshield that read, slower traffic, keep right. <laughs> you should have seen the look on people's faces as they drove down Route 50 in the fast lane, only to look up in their rear view mirror and see this thing quickly approaching. Quick flash of the lights and they would pull over and let them by. <laughs> Bill was an engineer, but if any of you had seen his prowess in front of the bar or in a hearing room, knew that he would have been a very good attorney. All that fast driving landed Bill in court many times. The amazing thing is, he always won. Who knew the signs on the Dulles tow road were the wrong color? Who knew that Fairfax County Police had no jurisdiction on an FAA owned highway? Who knew that you could not shoot radar from a bucket truck because the trajectory of the radar was wrong? Who knew that the speed limit sign was placed in the proper position? Who knew? Bill knew. <laughs> and he was happy to explain it to the judge. <laughs> Bill taught me the phrase that pays is, Mr. Druin, you're free to leave. <laughs> Billy was always way ahead of his time. Long before the advent of the GPS, Billy would help organize an annual event called the Meatball Rally. It was loosely based on the cannonball run that was later depicted in the movies. The object was to be the one quickest to navigate between six or eight checkpoints on a course of about 300 miles. You only found out where these points were when you pulled up to the starting line with a half tank of gas. Billy was extremely competitive in this sport. I count as some of my greatest personal triumphs having won four meatball trophies myself over the years. There was only one person you were trying to beat, Billy. To handicap himself one year, he hired a limo and a driver so that he could sit in the back of his great coupon and laugh at us as we sped by. <laughs> and he still took home a trophy that year for the shortest distance cover. And the event would always end at a wilderness campsite, and only Billy would be there, the one camping with his Waterford stemware. Pinky extended, spinning the yarns about the day's travels. My brother Bill was all. He turned out to be a pretty good kid after a rocky start. Both of my parents were so very proud of their oldest boy. He was a loving and nurturing brother, and a loving husband, and most of all, a great dad. After these last 20 minutes or so, you know all about Bill's accomplishments, far too numerous to list here. My faith teaches me that God's divine providence puts people in your life for a reason. And I know that you are all here because Bill positively touched your lives somehow. Let's all work to keep that spirit alive. Live your life like Bill did. Live in relentless pursuit of your goals, always humbled by the humble, but also unapologetic of the facts that support the truth. Billy's reward was not here. He will be rewarded a thousandfold in heaven. But our reward is Bill's legacy. And not a day will go by that our family, 
this town and all of you will see and feel the around you. Do you want to go forward doing what is right and good? Then do what Bill would do. Do what Bill would do. May you, Brother Bill, and all the faithfully departed, rest in peace. Now, please to be enjoying this little video trip. Thank mm -hmm. you.